Today we are working on solving equations, but we're going to take it one step further. And what we're going to do is we're going to be going over what allows us to do the various steps that we do when we're solving an equation. That's referred to as justifying each step. So we have to be able to justify why did we just do that operation that we did. So before we actually get into our justification, let's review our steps for solving a problem or a equation. If you remember, we borrowed from Miss Enright her dog's crap violently. Little acronym there. What did the D stand for? Distribute. So we're going to distribute through any parentheses. Of course, not every problem is going to have parentheses, but if they are there, that is the first thing that we want to do. So like, for example, in the second problem on your problem of the day, you had to distribute the negative sign through your parentheses first. Second one, what does the C stand for? Joe? Combine, Combine any like terms. Bless you, by the way. So you want to look at the left side of your equal sign. If there's any like terms there, you want to combine them. You then want to look at the right side of your equal sign. If there's any like terms there, you want to combine those. And then what did the V stand for? Nobody. Rhymes with variable. Variable. So we want to collect the variable onto one side. So there's two steps here, because you always do first, you're either add or subtract to collect a variable on one side. Sometimes you need to add to subtract the actual letter itself to combine it with another one. Sometimes it's just a number. And then what do we do last? Multiply or divide. So like that first problem in your problem of the day, you should have multiplied both sides times three to get your final answer. As I said last time, that's the one a lot of people forget is when you have x divided by a number, you've got to multiply on both sides. So let's take a look at our first example. We are to find the solution, so we need to go ahead and solve it. We need to then justify each step, and we need to check. So we have three things we have to do with these problems today. So looking at number one, do we have anything to distribute? No. So we got to combine like terms. No, they're already combined. So now we just got to collect the variable on one side. So we're going to start by adding 17. So we get 3x equals 69. And then what's our last step? Divide by 3. So x equals what? 23. All right, so we got our first step done. We found our solution. So now we need to go through and justify each step. So what we use for our justification, you may not have heard before, but what allows us to add the 17 to both sides of the equal sign is what we call the addition property of equality. That's the whole key thing there. So this is the addition property of equality. And it's because of that that you have to add it to both sides. You have to keep it equal on both sides of that equal sign. So then the second thing that we did there is we divided by 3 on both sides of our equal sign. So that one was our division property of equality. Because of that property that we divide on both sides of the equal sign. And we only did two steps there. We added and then we divided. So you only need two justifications. You just need a justification for each step that you do. So then our last thing we have to do here is we have to check to make sure our answer is actually correct. So I'm going to go back up to the original problem and plug in a 23 for my x. So 
So 3 times 23, what do we get? Minus 17 equals 52. So then what is 69 minus 17? So we get 52 equals 52. So that means we did it correctly. So step, or problem number two, what do we want to do first? I heard somebody whisper. We want to distribute our three. So that gives us a 6n minus 3. And because we are justifying each step, don't try to do two things at once. We do one thing at a time. So here we did our distributive property. Our second step would be to combine like terms. So do I have anything on the left side to combine? No. How about the right side? Yeah, we got this 5n minus 2n. So that gives us 6n minus 3 equals 3n plus 3. Now we got to collect the variable onto one side. So I'm going to subtract my 3n over to my 6n. So I get 3n minus 3 equals 3. And so now we add our 3 over. That gives us a 3n equals 6. And our last step, divide by 3. So n equals a 2. Now we need to write our justification. First thing we did was we used our distributive property. I'm going to shorten that to write distributive prop. Then what did we do next to get from here down to here? We combine like terms. So we write combine like terms. After we combine our like terms, we subtracted the 3n, which what property would that be? Very good. Subtraction property of equality. But that's what commits it to memory. Writing something 17 times is what commits it to memory. So when we added our 3 over, that was our addition property of equality. And what was the last one we used? Division property of equality. And those are the only properties you're going to use when you're justifying. You're not going to use anything else. It's either going to be distributive property, combine like terms, and then your addition property of equality, subtraction property of equality, multiplication property of equality, or division property of equality. You don't have to worry about whether it's commutative or associative or identity. It's not going to be any of those. It's literally just those six. What's the last thing I have to do for problem number two? Check. I may not have given myself enough room, but we'll see. So every n that I saw, I plugged in a 2. So on the left side, what do we get inside our parentheses? We have 2 times 2. Minus 1. On my left side, I have 3 times 3. Right side, 5 times 2. 10, and then plus 3. Minus 4. I wasn't combining them just yet. 
So on our left side, we have a 9. Right side, we have 13 minus 4 gives us a 9. So it checks out. Number three. Again, this was like one on the problem of the day today. What do we want to do first? Go. Add eight to both sides. So we get 13 equals x over 7. Again, remember, this means it's x divided by 7. So I want to multiply it times 7. Because then my 7's cancel, because division and multiplication are inverses. And then what do we have on the left side? 13 times 7. Hmm? 91. So let's write our justifications. First one, addition, property of equality. Very repetitive. And then the second one we actually haven't written yet, but what did we do? Multiplication property of equality. If you haven't already done so yet, go ahead and do your check. Plug 91 in for x. Let's see if it works. So we're going to see if 5 equals 91 divided by 7 minus 8. should check out. We did do that one correctly. Questions on those ones? Let's take a look at the back. Now we do have some situations that happen where there isn't a solution at all. You go through and you solve the problem correctly and then you get to the bottom and you get something that doesn't make any sense like this. Your variables cancel out all together. You're left with like 35 equals 6. Well, is 35 equals 6? No, never in any lifetime has 35 equals 6. So that ends up being that there is no solution to that problem. Another situation that may arise is you may have infinitely many solutions. And that would be an example where you end up with like 4 equals 4. Well, yeah, 4 does equal 4. That's a very true statement. So that's an infinitely many solutions. Now the reason that this happens is if you were to take both sides of your equal sign and graph them, for the no solution one, they would end up being parallel lines, which is why they have no solution. Do parallel lines ever cross? No, they never, ever, ever cross. So our two expressions would end up being parallel to each other. For the infinitely many one, if you took your two expressions on either side of the equal sign, they end up being the same exact line. So every single point on that line is a solution to it, which is why there's infinitely many, because does a line ever end? No, a line continues on forever. So it has infinitely many solutions. So what we're working on today is how do you find out algebraically whether it's no solution or infinitely many solutions. 
So let's take a look at number four. We are to solve the equations below. Does not say anything about justify, so we don't have to justify these equations. We're just solving them. And then check your identity solution. So if it works out that it's infinitely many, which we refer to as an identity, we have to check those solutions. So if we take a look at number four, we don't have any like terms to combine on the left, but do we on the right? Yeah. So when I combine them, on my right side I have a 9m plus 5. Negative 3 plus 12 gives us 9. So next I would try to get my m's together. So if I subtract 9m, they cancel on both sides of my equal sign. And all that's left is negative 4 equals 5. Which does negative 4 equal 5? No. So we put a little line through our equal sign. Those are not equal. Negative 4 does not equal 5. And you have to make sure you write the phrase, no solution. That would be our answer to this problem. Again, if I were to graph the left side and then graph the right side, they would end up being parallel lines, which is why there's no solution. <laughs> so we'll take a look at number five. What do we need to do first in our quest to solve number five? I heard somebody whisper, distribute. So our left side stays as 2a plus 3. That does not change. Right side, 1 half times 6, 3. 1 half times 4. Does anybody notice anything at this step? Yeah. What do we notice? Aren't sides exactly the same? Yeah, they are exactly the same. 2a plus 3, if I rearrange my right side, I have 2a plus 3. It's the same exact thing on each side. So this is what our, we call our infinitely many solutions. But if you read our directions, they want us to write the word identity. We didn't have to keep going. It's exactly the same, so it's an identity. Directions also tell us to check your identity solution. So the way you check those problems is you pick any number. I recommend using a smaller number. I'll pick 4. And I'm going to plug 4 in for my A, see if I get the same number. And again, we go back to the original equation and we plug it in. So I get, let's see here, 8 plus 3 is 11. And then 1 half times 16 plus 6 is 22. So I got 11 equals 11. Any number you pick, you should get whatever equals whatever. If you picked a different number, that's fine. Number six, we have a fraction equaling a fraction. So we want to do what? Cross multiply. Some people call it the butterfly. Whatever you want to call it, doesn't matter. So we got to do 15 times x plus 4. And I put x plus 4 in parentheses because that is my binomial. It's got two terms there equals 5 times 3x plus 12. Remember, when we cross multiply, they become equal to each other. So we want to distribute. When I distribute my 15, I get 15x plus 60. When I distribute my 5, 
I get it 15x plus 60. So we have yet again another identity. So since it's an identity, we have to pick just any number to check it. So somebody give me a number. Caitlin? Four? All right, we're going with four again. So four plus four over five. We're going to see if that's equal to three times four plus 12 over five. Oh, good. You're paying attention. Over 15. So four plus four gives me 8 over 5. Over on the other side, 3 times 4 plus 12 gives us 24 over 15. Can I reduce 24 over 15? How does that reduce to? 8 over 5. So I have 8 over 5 equals 8 over 5. And that checks out. Do you guys know how to reduce fractions in your calculator? Yeah? Some people know? Here, we'll pause for a second. Let's try it. All right, last problem in our notes. Let's take a look at number seven. What do we want to do first? We got some distributing of a two and a three-fourths. So I get 4B plus 8B plus 2 equals 3 fourths times 16, 12B, 3 fourths times 20, yeah, times negative 20, should get negative 15. So I have some like terms on the left side of the equal sign there. I'm going to combine 4B plus 8B gives us 12B. Equals 12B minus 15. So I try to get my Bs together. And I'm left with 2 equals negative 15, which does 2 equal negative 15? No. So this is our no 